With us today is um, Sal Gilberti, who runs Tucrium Trading. Now, Tucrium offers some unusual ETFs. They own single play bets on agricultural commodities like corn or soybeans. So my first question to Sal is, what's the point of these things? Who uses these and why? Are they trying to hedge inflation? Are they trying to hedge their stock portfolios? Or maybe they're doing a little both? Or are they speculating? That's three possibilities. I, I actually think it's all three, Bill. Um, thank you for having me and asking the question. Basically, what what investors do, unless you want to trade futures and you want if you want exposure to these commodities, and again, we're corn, soybeans, wheat, and sugar, single commodity funds plus a multi. Um, the only way to do that is either with a futures account or with these ETFs that we offer. So we're, we we offer these ETFs. People use them to trade which is, is fine, but people, I think, mostly use them to diversify their portfolio. They, they know about commodities. Most people know that oil and gold are you know, pretty good commodities to have as diversifiers in your portfolio. They don't really think of grains, although now they do. They think of those since we, we launched these funds 13 years ago and since um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine where grains got in the news. People are aware that grains are a very good diversifier. And in fact, 10 of the last 11 S&P 500 pullbacks of 10% or more, the S&P grains index outperformed the stock market quite substantially. So again, people won't stop eating if, if there's a, a stock market crash. So it tends to be as portfolio stabilizer and diversifier. And that's what people use it for. So let me jump in here with a question, a big picture question. Uh, you were born 63 years ago. And in time, what's happened to the price of grains? Maybe you ought to compare it to the cost of living or something. And what's happened to consumption of important grains like corn over the past 63 years? All right. You bring up a very important point, Bill. Grains, when you look at long-term academic studies, um, they tell you that they have very poor returns because they look at the price in, in you know, X year, you're saying 1960, and I don't know what it was offhand, but I'm going to guess it was around $2 a bushel. I'm just going to guess it, it wasn't far from that 50 cents either way. And, you know, right now, corn, as we record, this is somewhere between five and six dollars a bushel. Most people would say for 60 years, that's not a very good return. But that's not how grains work. Grains work in that they're subsidized by every government of the world. So people have enough food. And to your question of, of what has production done, demand and production kind of keep track. Thankfully, that's why we don't have mass starvation and production of of wheat, let's say, was about 230 million metric tons around 1960. And I'm just using estimates. It's now 790 million. It's 340 percent. I actually I actually we've done the research uh, for this time period. So off the top of my head, um, I'm giving you approximate numbers. Corn was was around 200 million metric tons. And now it's one point two billion metric tons. So you got a 600% increase roughly. Okay. In crazy. My Wait a minute now. So, so you had a demand for corn that's gone up sixfold. That's correct. And, 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 and you produced sixfold as, as much. How is that possible given that there is a lot more land on the planet than there was in 1960? Um, technology, genetic engineering, John Deere tractors that are operating on computers. The yield per acre has gone up around the world because of advances and because of science, basically, because of ag tech, which people now call it. But th that's what's kept the world fed. A lot of people don't want to hear about genetically modified things, but genetic no, modification- they go crazy when they hear GMO, some of yeah, them anyway. That's a first but world luxury that we have of being able to go crazy with GMO. GMO is responsible for the, the lives of billions of people. They are here and lived on this planet, many billions of people because of genetic modification. All right, so let's let's get into the uh, financial details here. So your funds, and you got four of them for single play commodities: corn, soybeans, sugar, and uh, wheat. All right, so you you don't own bushels of wheat; you buy futures in Chicago, right? Is it the Chicago Merck? That's correct. We, we buy we buy futures inside our ETF. So the ETF's performance will will go. It will move up and down directionally with the futures that it holds, and the return to the investor will be will be that less the fees and expenses of the fund. That's how it works. All right. Now, let's see here. I could shortchange this whole thing. I shortcut this whole thing. 
I could buy futures in Chicago and own this stuff, but I got this little problem. If I don't roll over the futures position when it matures, then I wake up one day and some truck is unloading 5,000 bushels of corn on my front lawn, right? Is that what happens? Um, it, it's what happens, but it won't happen on your front lawn. It happens uh, automatically somewhere in an improved storage facility by the exchange. Now, you know, before you get to that point, you'll be getting a margin call. It will keep rising the last 10 days of you holding that contract. You'll have plenty of notice. If you ignore that, you'll end up owning some corn somewhere and, and footing the bill. You don't actually have to go get it. It won't show up in your yard, but you'll, you'll have it and you'll be financially at least responsible for it if you trade the futures. Now, that's we, we kind of make it easy to take all that away from you. You don't worry about that. We just package the futures inside of an ETF. We remember to roll them. We are professionals at this and we do that. And the ETF is simply exists for you to, to gain a price exposure to the commodity. And if I could go back to your, your other question about the price, what it's done since 1960. If you just go back the last 15 years, okay, let's just take modern history. The price of corn has gone from $3.50 to over $7, three separate times in the last 15 years. So in essence, you've got a commodity that trades at or near its cost of production, which traditionally has been the futures equivalent of around $3.50. And when there's a drought or, or a supply disruption, the demand is very steady, as we've referenced earlier. And so you, with, with a lack of supply or diminished supply, even a little bit, it has a dramatic effect on prices. So corn in the last 15 years has doubled three times from the same level, from the cost. If my of timing were perfect, I could have gotten rich. It's kind of hard to know about that timing, though. It's, it is. It's pretty, we, pretty darn high. If, if I could do it, anybody could do it, and the futures would be trading at different prices, um, right? They, they might. The futures go by the fundamentals. Is there enough or not? And the price moves around, and investors get to participate in that. These markets are so enormous that there's really no amount of speculative money that can go into the futures or, for that matter, the ETF that's going to affect the price. The price is gonna be the price based upon the supply and demand of corn. The interesting part is because governments subsidize agriculture and farmers, the natural state of affairs is to trade at your cost of production. So what people should do, and what we, what we have people saying they do do, advisors call us and say, you know what, last time corn was flatlined at 350, I saw it there for a couple of years. I bought your corn fund, I put 1% of my portfolio in your corn fund, it just kind of sat around for a couple of years. And guess what, I just had this great return and thank you so much. And I'm gonna do that again next time. So that's it's nice that people are doing that. We don't give investment advice, but that's what we know people are doing. And one advice advisor even told us there's a there's an expression wait wait drought out so he waits for the price of corn to flatline then he knows it's at its cost of production whatever that might be it's just flatlined and not trading there not moving he buys it he waits it in his portfolio w-e-i-g-h-t then he waits he waits for a drop w-a-i-t when there's a drought he gets out that's that's okay, how it's not it's just drought. Let's, let's think of some other things weren't there some floods in china a couple of years ago did that screw up the uh, corn output that actually started or maybe wheat or maybe soybeans, soybeans. That's what correct. And soybeans, as a matter of fact, from from 1960 to to now is up 1500 percent production. OK, that's the biggest number. Soybeans have the, the most amazing growth of the last six decades than the other two big grain commodities of corn and wheat. Now, that said, soybeans and wheat production, mostly wheat production and corn actually were affected three years ago in China. And that actually kicked off that event, which was a flood. OK, remember, floods, fire and famine. These are not just biblical events to farmers. They're their daily reality. That's what people we're insulated. We live in cities. The food's in our grocery store. We don't really think about the fact that floods, fire and famine affect production of food. And when because the supply and demand is so balanced, you, if you have a disruption in supply, demand, people don't stop eating. No one will not eat their ba breakfast bagel in New York because it doesn't rain in, in say, Kansas. They're still going to eat their bagel and the price of wheat's going to go up if there's a drought in Kansas. That's how it works. I guess that's so, what the economists say is an inelastic demand. That is correct. Demand is growing steadily and it's inelastic. And the bottom line is three years ago, the, the global appreciation in grain prices, the inflation in grain prices was kicked off by those massive floods in China, which caused China to become an enormous wheat importer, which they'd never done before. They imported nominal amounts, no one cared. Suddenly they became the world's largest wheat importer. That 
blew everybody away. It diminished our wheat supplies. We went from global wheat surpluses of about six months to, to wheat surpluses of about four months in the United States. And people weren't used to that. And that's what made the price go high. And then, of course, the, the Russian war in, in Ukraine. Oh, yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit more about what happened a year ago, a little over a year ago. So the, we, we kind of knew there were rumblings of war and this wheat prices started to move even before the Russians invaded. Am I right? That's right. Wheat prices started to move because of China three years before. Then the U.S. had a had a little mini drought in the Dakotas, a big wheat producing region. No, but I mean Canada. specifically last winter, February of two thousand. Right, and then last winter, it, it started moving before the, the cannons were fired. Right. Th that, that's right. And and but but you know what? That was the most well pre predicted war. I mean, Russia didn't mince words and, and we saw their troop movements and the United States was very vocal about saying Russia was about to invade in the Ukraine. For some reason, equities markets ignored that. Commodities traders are a little more adept at seeing things, I think, and they, they started buying wheat early. I see. I see. When you were a teenager, wasn't there some big move where the Russians started buying U.S. wheat? I've forgotten why they ran out of wheat. That's right. It was called the Great Grain Robbery. And they had a, a hiccup in their wheat production and they needed to buy wheat. And in those days, um, you know, you buy wheat in the over the counter. You're, you're a wheat trader. You call another wheat trader and buy wheat. It doesn't make the news. It just you guys just did a transaction together. So in those days, there was no reporting system. And that is, in fact, why now there is a required daily reporting system for any exporter of U.S. grains. If they sell something for export, if they make a commitment to sell something for export, it needs to be reported within 24 hours. And those things move the markets a little bit each, each day as you watch the trends and you can see so that we're never caught asleep again. Russia came in and bought all of the United States' wheat. The United States was the main exporter of wheat at the time. Besides, well, There Russia. go my bagels. My goodness, I don't want that to happen again. Correct. Well, what well, else that, drives that prices in the U.S.? What else drives it? It isn't just whether I'm eating a bagel. It's he's also got uh, also got animal consumption. So if if the price of of um, eggs is going up because chickens are having flu and they aren't eating anymore because they had the flocks had to be killed off, that will reduce grain consumption, right? That's a weird kind of dynamic. Eggs go up, chickens die. And now I don't need so much corn. Then the corn price goes down, right? That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Now, I think most people don't realize the number one use of corn globally is to feed animals. Same with soybeans. The number two use of corn is to create ethanol. Now, that's reversed the United States. We use a little bit more corn for ethanol than for animal feed. But if you are eating any animal meat at all, you are consuming corn. If you are putting gasoline in your car in the United States and elsewhere, you are consuming corn. People don't realize that. There's there's a study that's been referenced widely of the average 10,000 items in a grocery store, 4,000 of those have corn in them as a product. Corn, corn makes plastic. It makes all kinds of things. So it's basically used for feed, for fuel, and then for all kinds of other things you, you you can't even imagine. And that's what people don't understand. So when they think, do I need commodities exposure in my portfolio? And they all think, yeah, I've got gold and yeah, I've got oil. You need to think about grains. It's really important to do that. Well, how about that uh, crazy ethanol business? Now, you might not think it's crazy because you used to trade ethanol, right? But that's sucking up a lot of our food. I'm not sure I want that in my gas well, tank. But uh, it's because not. it's hurting when I go to buy margarine, right? But it's actually not because what happened was it, to, to make ethanol, the easiest way to make ethanol is from sugar. That's why Brazil is makes the cheapest and, and, and you know most affordable ethanol in the world. They have sugar crop down there. We have corn. Once you take, the, it's a two-step process in the United States. You take the starch out of the corn, turn it into a sugar and turn it into ethanol. But guess what? You take the starch out of the corn, you still have the fiber the oil and the protein left, it's an animal feed. So all the extra corn that we're growing, what people said that the food for fuel debate went away really quickly. People got really upset when ethanol came on scene. They said it's going to take our food away. Actually, because corn is mainly used to feed animals, when we grew more corn for ethanol and we only used the starch, that actually increased the supply of corn for animals. It's number one use dramatically. And that's You've why the food for fuel went away. Style. You're almost sounding like a presidential candidate in Iowa defending the ethanol program. Well, I want to move on to some personal stuff here. So you started out trading diesel oil with Cargill, and then you migrated into weird other stuff like orange juice. 
that was a long, uh, long road. It was many multi-decade road. But yes, I was hired by Cargill to trade petroleum products, which is what I did. And then it, it morphed into, in the end, I was working for a division of Societe Generale, um, where I started the ethanol trading market, the ethanol swap market. And that desk kind of kind of morphed into a multi-commodity desk. And yeah, we did some orange juice. We did we did all kinds of, of, of trades. Yes, including I, I did a weather trade. So I did a snow hedge for, for 13 a different snow hedge. Stores. Yeah. All right. Yeah. If you can do a drought hedge, maybe you could do yeah, that too. All right. Great. Well, there's one other thing people be curious about. Your name, Gilberti, will ring a bell for people in Southern Connecticut or in the New York area because I go to their gardener's shop and it says Gilberti herbs. So you must be connected to those herb people somehow, right? I, I actually am. I'm sitting on the farm where those herbs are grown. That's where I keep uh, one of my offices. And uh, that's my dad's business. It's a family business. It hit 100 years old last year and they're very proud of it. And it's, uh, it's a well-known business. I see. So you're carrying on the family farm tradition in an unusual way with futures and exchange traded funds. Well, thank you very much, Sal. It's been fun talking to you. And let's hope that we don't have any droughts soon. Unless, of course, I'm long corn. <laughs> you're, every, there'll be enough. Let's hope there'll be enough. <laughs>